So let's put an object on the ground right here and let's have four people pushing it in four different directions. So what's happening here is a very strong person is exerting five newtons of force in this direction, pushing it that way. Someone's pushing it that way with three newtons of force while someone else is pushing it that way with two newtons of force and someone else is pushing it that way with two newtons of force. Now, this object is going to move because the the forces are not in equilibrium. So the question is, which way is this object going to move? All right, let's set ourselves up using vectors. We'll call this the I direction and this the J direction. Now remember, this is a top-down view. People are pushing this around the place. Now, what's gonna happen? Well, if we want a resultant, we just need to add the vectors together. So we have a vector here of 5i, a vector here of 3j, a vector here of negative 2i, and a vector here of negative 2j. So that's going to be our resultant vector. Now when we add these forces together, we get 5i minus 2i, which is 3i, and 3j minus 2j, which is uh, just j. Okay, now that is our resultant vector. Now what does it mean? It means that our object is going to start moving in the direction of 3i plus j. There is a force, a resultant force of 3i plus j newtons, um, 3i plus j, sort of like that. So the resultant vector is 3i plus j newtons. Now we can also come up with a magnitude for how many newtons there are, just by finding the magnitude of the resultant. So we know that there's root 10 newtons there, about three point something newtons is what the force is there. We can also figure out what direction it's moving in. That angle there would be 18.43 degrees, just by using a little right angle triangle there. Now, of course, depending on the question, if they were asking about true bearings or something, you would need to find that angle, which you can just do 90 minus that to give you that angle here. But really what we're looking at is if there's a bunch of forces acting on an object, you can add those forces together to get the resultant force. There's also some other ways you can think about it. So what if you had a particle, this big pink circle is my particle here, and there were two forces acting on it. Five Newton force acting at this angle, and three Newton force acting at this angle. Now this I and J I've just drawn in there so you can see that there are I and J components. Now, I'm not given this one in I and J components. I'm not given it in component form, and I'm not given this in component form either. Now, you could, if you wanted to, convert them to component form and add them together. So our first vector here, uh, if we convert it to component form, it would be 5 cos 15i plus 5 sine 15j. And then we also need to add our second force here, which would be 3 cos 60 in the i direction plus 3 co uh, sine 60 in the j direction. And then you can add them together. We're going to get some decimal answers here. Now when you convert all four of those to decimals and then add the i components and add the j components, you'll get this answer here. Now what this says is that if you are pulling this particle with this force and this force in those directions, the result will be a force of 6.33 in the i direction and 3.89 in the j direction, which is going to look something like that. That's going to be your resultant force. Now, you didn't have to convert to component form. Instead, you could have thought about triangles. So, triangles, what do I mean by that? Well, we've got our particle here, and there's this force acting on it, so three newtons like that, and then there's another force adding, acting on it here. Both of these forces are vectors, and if you want to add vectors graphically, you just take the tip of one and put it to the tail of the other. So we get something that looks like this. Three newtons in this direction, where this angle is 60 degrees, and uh, five newtons in that direction. And it's going to give you a resultant vector of in that direction, right there. All right, that's a little bit better. Green here. All right, if that's a 60 degree angle, what else do we know? We know that this bit here is a 15 degree angle because I've just pulled this vector up there. If we go down here like this, that can be a 90 degree angle, which makes that a 30 degree angle, which makes this a 90 degree angle. 30, 90, 15, the angle between those two bits here 
is 120, 135 degrees. So the triangle that we're dealing with is this one right here. And we've got two sides and an angle between, which means we can use the cosine rule. So when I put it into my cosine rule and solve it, I'll get x equals 7.43 newtons, which is the magnitude of this force. It's a little bit different to the previous method where I didn't initially get the magnitude of the force, I got the force in I and J components. Um, now I could find this angle too if I wanted to, uh, and there's a variety of different ways to come up with that angle. But if you come up with that angle, um, you'll also know the direction that this force is working in. Just to give you a roadmap here, if you wanted to find this angle, the easiest way to do it is to use the sine rule to find this angle that I'll call theta. Now we know that this angle, that that angle is 60 degrees. So if we know what theta is, 60 minus theta would be that. So there's the sine rule there. Theta is equal to 28.41, which means that this unknown angle here, which I can call beta, would be equal to 60 minus 28.41, which is 31.59 degrees. So using this second method, I've been able to find the magnitude of that force and also the direction of that force. If I know a magnitude and a direction of a force, I can find the force in component form as well if I want and vice versa with that previous method. Now what if there was three forces acting in like weird directions? Now again you can use both methods here although that second method isn't really a triangle method. So the first method would be to come up with all of them in component form and then just add up the component form. So the resultant would just be whatever this is in component form plus whatever this is in component form plus whatever this is in component form. That'll give you your resultant in component form, and then you can figure out whether you want to find the magnitude or the direction after that. Your other option here is to push all of these um, vectors into something and then draw that something geometrically. So I'm going to take this vector, bring it over to here, and then I'm going to take this vector and tack it onto that vector, and then I'm going to take this vector and tack it onto that vector. And what you get is a resultant vector that looks like this. And so if you draw in all of your angles and you do a little bit of geometry, you should be able to figure out what that magnitude is. And once you know what that magnitude is, you can probably find out what that direction is. Once you know what the direction is, you could probably convert that back to component form. Now, with this question, depending on what information you're given, maybe this is easier. Depending on what information you're given, maybe this sort of thing is easier. But you need to keep in mind that both of these are valid methods of working when it comes to finding resultant forces.